Okay, welcome to Matrix Live Season 3, Episode 5. Uh, today, we're joined by Amber Hawkow, um, and the topic is, we're going to talk all about Python 3. Now, some of you might know that over the past sort of six months or so, we've been working on a project to port Synapse from Python 2 uh, to Python 3. And so what we're going to do is talk a little bit about why, why would you do that? Uh, why is Python 3 such a big deal? Why is, why is porting hard? Um, you know, what, 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 what makes that so? Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about our experiences of actually doing this in Synapse. We're going to talk about um, the advantages and performance wins that, uh, that we've managed to um, get from doing it. And then finally talk a little bit about, well, what next? You know, how, how can you get your hands on uh, uh, this, this new shiny uh, world of Synapse? Um, so that's it. So firstly, Amber, thank you very much for uh, uh, joining us today. Can you maybe just start by introducing yourself, telling everyone a little bit about your background? Um, and yeah, we'll get going that way. Cool. Um, so yeah, I'm Amber Brown. Uh, a lot of people know me as Hawkel. Uh That's my handle. I've uh, been pretty active in the Twisted community for the past half decade, uh, working both uh, as, a, as a maintainer and core developer, as well as the release manager since 2013. Um, I'm from Australia, and I'm one of uh, New Vector's uh, growing remote employees. We're sort of all across the globe now. And uh, yeah, I, I joined uh, New Vector to work on uh, Synapse stuff about six months ago, almost six months ago. And uh, yeah, it's been a quite exciting time working on Synapse in the back end and a little bit of spec here and there. And uh, yeah. Oh, and by the way, I should say um, that Amber has been leading this this effort to port to Python 3. Uh, I mean, it's it, it's been a whole team effort. You know, a bunch of the core team have been involved. Uh, also worth calling out um, community members who really got this project off the ground in the first place, particularly uh, Notafile and, and Crumble. Um, but it's Amber who's who's really led this um, uh, initiative and um, you know got got it to the state where it is today and um, got, got it over the line. All right, so before we dive into all the details, Amber, just tell us a little bit about um, what 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 is Python three? Why does it even exist? What were the design goals? Um, what does it solve over Python two? Like, what, why did someone go to all this kind of trouble? So Python itself is quite an old language, everything considered. It's nearly, if not 20 years old. Uh, it's uh, Most of what we know has been Python 2. There was a Python 1 before it that was uh, mainly just a sort of a niche thing and a few people used. But Python 2 uh, was really like the big uh, application of uh, when, when Python started getting some real traction. Now, as, as it did gain traction uh, in the early 2000s, a couple of issues sort of uh, fell out. So the most notable of that was uh, there was a lot of old sort of crafty things from uh, old platforms like AIX and stuff that no one ever really uses anymore, as well as uh, some of the biggest issues being like uh, Unicode, for example. So uh, Python 2, or well, Python 1 and Python 2 were written in the age where ASCII was kind of good enough for everyone, uh, in a sense. Right. Um, and Unicode was was only bolted on later as like a special storage type and not as like the first class string representation. Now this caused a lot of problems when people were writing things for a more internet connected age because you had uh, issues where people would write, uh, they'd write a string and then they'd try and add a Unicode string to it. And if it wasn't a ASCII string, then it could throw up an error saying, you know, you're implicitly trying to concatenate two types of strings. So that plus Unicode not sort of being as first class as it could, like a lot of the standard library returned byte strings uh, rather than Unicode strings, meant that there was no real nice way to do it in a backwards compatibility sort of uh, nice way. So Python 3 was like, hey, let's let's take stock. Let's have a look at all, all of the language features. Let's say what ones are misfeatures and what ones you know need more prominence. And this allowed them to sort of make a nice clean break. So things like Unicode becoming a first class citizen, uh, iterators becoming a first class citizen. So like iter items became like items on Python 3, which meant that uh, you had that by default. So you didn't have to worry about random functions returning this massive list instead of a more efficient iterator. 
as well as a chance to get rid of some of the older modules that were maybe not maintained or maybe not relevant in the modern age. So they decided to do that as a as a brand new major version um, and you know uh, keep Python 2.7 around as a long-term compatibility alternative for people that hadn't yet been able to port. All right, and, and so this, um, and just to sort of put this into context, Python 3.0 came out in 2008, mm -hmm. um, which is uh, you know, quite a long time in, in computer years. Why, why, why has adoption not been sort of you know, instant? Why, 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 are still, why are we having this call in 2018? Um, you know, what, what prevented um, migration from Python 2 to Python 3? So a lot of the uh, sort of clean break changes made it hard for people to maintain Python uh, code bases that targeted the uh, huge amount of Python 2 users. It's like nearly everyone, uh, like all the distro shipped it. Like it was quite hard to get a Python 3 version in the very early days in like a, because usually people would get it from their distribution or whatever. So it wasn't until like Ubuntu and Debian and that would package it that people could actually get their hands on it. So. Um, there was a requirement for Python 2 and Python 3 compatible software. Now, the, uh, the, the method that uh, Python Dev, which is the group that maintains uh, both CPython and like, the, the language spec, um, said was that, you know, we've, we've written this tool called 2 to 3. And what it does is it takes your Python 2 code and it transforms it into Python 3 code. Now, that worked for a lot of projects that were already as they say, like Unicode clean. So they were handling Unicode strings correctly and all of that. But a lot of applications at the time weren't that. A lot of people were sort of not realizing that Python 2.7 was allowing them to shoot themselves in the foot with Unicode. So 2.3 to three sort of gave very incorrect sort of transformations for a, for a lot of uh, software. And so when 2.3 to three wasn't an option, it was kind of like you had to maintain a version a uh, Python 3 compatible version of the code base and have two code bases, which just wasn't viable. So, and you couldn't drop Python 2 yet because there were still, and to this day, still millions of users. So dropping 2.7 to go on Python 3 was, uh, was not an option, especially back then. However, um, Python 3.4 or 3.3 and 3.4 introduced some nice changes that made, uh, made it much easier to write a Python 2 and Python 3 compatible code base like Synapse now is. So the same source will run on either. Um, and then that means that you don't have to maintain two different code bases. You don't have to worry about some automated process potentially mangling your code. But that was only in 3.3 and 3.4, which was quite a few years into uh, Python 3's lifespan before people could really start porting real applications, uh, like especially ones that had a long legacy on Python 2. Right. Um, to Python 3. And Twisted was one of those. We only really just completed our port last year for most of the major features. <clears throat> uh, and even then, we require some uh, Python 3.5 and 3.6 features to really make it work. Uh, so you had like large frameworks like that that didn't, uh, didn't upgrade uh, instantly, which also held a lot of the ecosystem back. There was also a problem with performance in the early days and uh, Python 3.0 was uh, unacceptably slow to a lot of people. It was a nice sort of experiment and sort of a, a sign of things to come, but not really something that a lot of people were ready to put in production until sort of 3.4, 3.5 days where it became a lot more mature and a lot of the performance gaps closed and some things even got faster than Python 2. So it wasn't until then that people really got behind it as an actual viable deployment target. Right, right. And at this point, um, I mean, Python 2 is really sort of staring end of life in the, in the face uh, come 2020. So, you know, you're starting to, uh, starting to become quite a serious um, uh, driver to, um, uh, to port. Yeah. And uh, so end of life is very at least for uh, Python, the Python maintainers. Um, there will be, it's likely to live on even longer because there is a lot of enterprise software and people are quite happy to pay uh, companies like Red Hat and IBM and similar for 
uh, long-term support. But as far as the community support and uh, a lot of libraries, uh, people are going to yeah, start dropping 2.7 support um, either, either in 2019 in preparation or on the release day is sort of a bit of a fanfare sort of right. thing. So yes, it, it is coming to the end of its days. And this is even the extended release. It was originally supposed to uh, be end of life, I think around Python, Python 3.5's release date. So this is an extended, <laughs> extended uh, end of life date. So it's, it's really gone this time where they're not, they're not delaying it any further. Okay. And you, mean, you, you touched on some of the performance um, improvements uh, that Python 3 um, you know, gives us. Um, could you just talk a little bit more about that? I, I'm particularly interested in um, how it manages Unicode under the hood. Uh, and also you touched a bit around um, iterators and lazy evaluation earlier. It would be good just to dig in there a little bit more. Yeah, so uh, let's start with iterators. So iterators are a really neat sort of concept uh, where if you have some sort of source of uh, information, so for example, you have a dictionary and you want to call dot keys on it to get all the keys. But say you're scanning for it to have a certain key. So you're like, you're like looping, like the, the naive implementation of this is looping over every entry in uh, dot keys until you find a result and then quitting out early. Now, without iterators, what will happen is when you call dot keys, it'll return a whole list with all of the keys in the dictionary. Right. Now, that if you're working on the entire dictionary's uh, keys, then you know that's, that's fine, that's not really a big deal. But when those dictionaries are potentially have thousands of keys, and you want the opportunity to quit out early without consuming the rest, iterators give you that power where it will only start reading it like bit by bit by bit instead of returning it all at once. So you right. get the, <coughs> excuse me, you get the memory uh, benefits of only having um, some of it in memory at once, only as much as you really need to do the current processing, as well as CPU benefits because it does mean that for example, if your, uh, uh, your, your dictionary keys can be hashables, which means that they can be actual objects. So if computing that hash or the key name or whatever is quite expensive, then you can potentially save a lot of time by not processing all of them by quitting out early. So well, like the cases where you're, uh, where you're like searching for things or only using part of it, it's a lot more efficient. Right. Um, this, right. this comes into into uh, comes really obvious when you have like nested uh, iterators because um, if it weren't uh, iterators, then you load the nest of each into memory. While nested iterators, you only really call the one value in memory for each layer of the stack. So that makes it a, a lot nicer and a lot more efficient. Right. Yeah. Very nice. Mm. Um, and Unicode. Uh, so. Python 3 has had a lot of uh, Unicode improvements. So with it being a first class citizen, that means that uh, a lot more people are using Unicode strings in our every day-to-day, uh, -day, um, sort of day-to-day -day usage. Because by default, if you write, quote, something, quote, you get a Unicode string. So there have been a lot of improvements, especially in encoding. So for example, if you're writing that out to a byte stream, uh, Python 3 has very uh, optimized, pretty much as optimized as you can get encoders for like encoding to ASCII and UTF-8. Now in memory, it'll also do some really clever things where on Python 2, if, if you had uh, a string, a Unicode string, uh, it would store it in what would be uh, termed this, the system Unicode um, Format. So on Windows, this would be like UTF-16 LE usually. I think on Mac OS, it would be like UTF-32. I'm not sure what Linux, it was configurable on Linux. So what that means is that Unicode strings internally would use that representation. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not very good for several reasons. Um, firstly, UTF, I think 32, one of, one of them, there's, there's a wide and a narrow build. Um, some of the builds would be unable to, not only be un unable to uh, address high uh, Unicode characters like emoji, which caused, uh, has caused some problems, I believe, with Synapse in the past with Python 2 wide and narrow builds. Right. Um, but also it meant that if you just had the string, if you just had the character A on Python 2, if you just had quotes A, quote, then it would take up uh, 
8 bits because it would be stored as a byte string, so implicitly ASCII. Now, if you did that on Python 3, it would store it as uh, whatever your Unicode representation was. <coughs> Excuse me. Which meant that on Python 2 with Unicode, it would store that character A in 16 or 32 bits, even though it could fit perfectly fine in 8 bits or right. even 7 bits because it's US ASCII. So for newer Python 3 versions, I've actually decided to have a look at the strings they're storing internally and go, is there a more efficient way of storing a string? So if you are, for example, writing, uh, so for example, if you load a JSON dictionary, um, that'll decode all of the strings as Unicode strings. Now, on Python 2, that'll mean that the uh, dictionary keys are Unicode. So you have things like ID, for example, uh, quite common key. You will, uh, now it's ASCII, um, so you'd expect it to take, you know, 16 bits would be the most efficient way. But in UTF-16, take 32 bits, and on UTF-32, it would take 64 bits. And Python 2 had no way of making that smaller without the developer going, hey, this fits in ASCII, let's change it to a byte string, which right. then meant that you were passing around the combinations of byte strings and Unicode, Unicode strings, which make, made things quite confusing and quite error prone. But Python 3 will <clears throat> now do that for you automatically. It'll go, this is an ASCII string, so we can fit it in um, ASCII. So we can fit in 8 bits. Um, while if it's, say, uh, something in the basic multilingual plane, it'll go, well, I think we can store this in, like, UTF-8 or UTF-16. And if you're using, like, the advanced multilingual, uh, the beyond multilingual plane, like emoji and stuff like that, it'll end up storing it in the larger uh, UTF format, formats. But it'll do it in the smallest representation possible, which means that if you're, if you're handling a lot of Unicode strings, especially Unicode strings that are ASCII, uh, which, for example, for us, um, uh, Matrix is you know, quite uh, multilingual and multinational, but uh, just from the nature of the uh, Western sort of origins of the internet, um, there are a lot of just, you know, English and, you know, people are unfortunately in, um, in non-English speaking countries used to, uh, systems spitting out, uh, and mangling their text. So they also sometimes write in English, um, or have Romanized characters. Those sorts of messages will now be quite optimized and quite, and take up as much RAM as they would on Python 2. But because we were handling them as Unicode in Python 2 as well, that means that we actually get a large memory benefit. Uh, right. While mm -hmm. for people uh, that are using non-English or non-Roman non characters, so actually like using uh, the higher bits of Unicode, um, we'll also see a benefit with those messages too, because a lot of them can fit in like UTF-16 or UTF-8 instead of uh, UTF-32. So you'll so we'll still still see some pretty good memory benefits from that without having to worry about potentially mangling that uh, Unicode or erroring out when using it. So Great, great. So from the programmer's point of view, this is you know this is completely abstracted away from you, but under the hood, Python 3 will figure out the most efficient way to store uh, whatever character it is. Um, and uh, so everybody wins. That sounds, uh, that sounds very nice. Yeah, it's completely abstract away from the programmer. It's just completely free, which is uh, is what I like as a programmer, not having <laughs> to uh, actually write the optimizations myself and have the language do it for me. Okay, so um, so so this all sounds great, um, mm -hmm. and you know we decided a little while ago. Okay, let's let, let's do all this to Synapse. Synapse is a, a big old code base. Um, how, how did you approach this? You know, what, what was your sort of method? Um, yeah, just talk us through how you how you went about this this project. So I've uh, <clears throat> ported quite a few code bases to Python three at this point. Twisted being the largest, so I've had the opportunity to learn from from those experiences and apply it a bit more directly to the Synapse code base. Mm -hmm. Now the biggest. Um, the biggest helper when you've when you've got a code base that you're switching from Python two two to Python three is that uh, is your test coverage because a lot of it isn't going to be like syntax errors that you can catch automatedly very nice because it's still it's still like Python like there's some 
uh, really old syntax that they got rid of, but a lot of it like that you were that if you were writing Python 2.7 today, it would be valid Python 3 code that potentially might do the wrong thing. So for example, right. concatenating mm -hmm. strings and all of that, you may end up trying to concatenate a byte string to a Unicode string, which you're not allowed to do on Python 3. You need to explicitly encode before you add to prevent, you know, accidentally uh, sort of mangling uh, text. So for that, it was very much a case of starting to get the unit tests to run. So once you have the unit tests to run, you can, uh, once you get them running, you can start enabling tests and go by fixing them one by one. Um, and sort of using that, you can work out some of the dependency graph because uh, in larger code bases like Twisted and Synapse, you have uh, interdependencies where the actual problem won't, like the upper modules might actually be completely fine and work perfectly fine on Python 3, but they'll rely on an underlying module that maybe doesn't. Right. So it's a, it's a good helper to sort of dig down and find out where the root of the problem lies. So once you've got your unit tests running, then things like integration tests and also just running it out in the field helps uh, find a lot of the bugs that you may not have had uh, unit test coverage for. And like Twisted has very high unit test coverage, Synapse has like, okay unit test coverage, but both still had things that fell through the cracks based purely on that. Um, because you, you may have like different APIs that people use or different special cases that you haven't written unit tests for. And just because you have test coverage doesn't mean you've uh, potentially mapped every single input to that function. Right. So then it was just a lot of running it in real life, getting, uh, seeing what happened, uh, like collecting tracebacks from people, collecting bugs and uh, sort of fixing them uh, one by one. <clears throat> and what... Uh... I mean, share your pain. What, 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 what was the bit that was, that was really the toughest on, on this project? What was, what was the bit you really just had to grit your teeth and grind through? So um, I think the, so Synapse is on the whole a fairly good code base for this sort of thing because um, it kind of deals with text a lot internally. While with Twisted, there's a lot of like, when you're dealing with raw HTTP, for example, in Twisted, there's like, is this text or is it actually just byte strings? Like HTTP headers, uh, like people might think of them as text, but people will put all sorts of garbage in them. So you've, you've kind of got to think really hard about what sort of data format is and how you can approach like reading it. Um, because it, it, you know, it might just be random bits that, <laughs> that someone sent in a HTTP header because people are allowed to do that. Right. While, Synapse is a bit more abstracted, so it deals a lot in text and JSON and sort of Unicode natively. So a lot of those problems uh, weren't there, but there were still quite a few issues uh, due to a lack of test coverage in uh, parts of the code base. So things that we sort of needed to finish in a rush and perhaps, you know, trying to get out the door, like GDPR is a good example where things right. that have a very strict time constraint and when you're sort of, you know, um, when you're a small project like Synapse is with only a couple of developers and community developers, then, you know, you don't really have all of the, uh, the liberties of pushing back on that sort of thing because you know, you've got a deadline and you've got to make it. So the, the Python 3 uh, port was not only actually getting into Python 3, but also paying back a lot of that technical debt from the past and improving CI and making sure that all this stuff that, you know, we hadn't had time to do in the past uh, was done so that not only I could approach the Python 3 porting in a more methodical way and sort of have a lot more, uh, real, uh, be able to put out a more reliable product, um, but also something so that I could actually trust that it sort of, it worked in practice as well as, because I had the unit test to prove it. So it was just a lot of writing unit tests and CI improvements and that sort of stuff, which does have greater, greater benefits uh, to the wider, you know, development. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it's always, always a good thing to have your test coverage up because when you're migrating uh, libraries, for example, when you're upgrading libraries or upgrading Python versions, um, especially uh, since uh, now we'll be keeping up to date with Python 3 versions. So where while well, on Python 2.7, like 2.7 didn't change for like seven yeah. years. So there was never really that concern. But 
but now on Python 3, there's a lot more sort of mobility in sort of things. So having that uh, robust test coverage in CI uh, to, you know, give, give yourself a bit of, uh, you can sort of trust that things will go well and sort of add, adds a bit of peace of mind. Um, so there's, there's been some benefits to that, even though it's been a bit painful along the way, making sure that, you know, tests work and they work like they would in real life. And, you know, we're not mocking out too much of the real stuff and, you know, only superficially testing. Yeah. So yeah, that's been the major pain point, but that's that sort of thing in any major software project. Once you have a large you know, rewrite or a large refactor or a large port like this, all of that stuff sort of comes to a head and you, you've got to pay it some time. So. Yeah. And look, as someone who um, contributes to Synapse code base, the improvements um, from around unit testing, but also particularly with CI, um, it's made my life an awful lot easier and, and ultimately means that um, yeah, we can go faster. Uh, so mm -hmm. yeah, that's, uh, that's been a definitely plus, plus sort of side effect of this, of, of, of this whole project. Yeah. All right. So look, let, let's dive into the um, uh, to my favourite bit of, of all of this. You know, one of the reasons that was sort of driving this project underneath it all, um, particularly for the metrics.org um, install of Synapse, um, you know, we needed to try and uh, get some performance gains, uh, and we thought Python three would be a good uh, a good path uh, towards that. We've been running metrics.org. Um, as pure Python 3 for uh, a few weeks now, and we, we sort of rolled it out incrementally. Um, and we've got some uh, uh, nice uh, Grafana uh, uh, graphs for you. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna take us through it, show us, uh, sh show us all the graphs. Cool, so let me get, I think this is a good graph to start with. Okay, how's that, can you see that? Yeah, yeah, it looks great. Cool. So, um, so you can see the uh, large dip on the left. So that's when we restarted our server, uh, our synchrotrons on uh, Python three. So you can see that. So synchrotron six and six, seven, and eight, I believe, were all Python three at that point. So you can see that the base memory usage is a lot lower. So in the eight hours that was running, it had time to fill up its caches and sort of uh, get somewhere close to a you know representative um, RAM usage. So the base level is much lower, uh, mostly because of those Unicode improvements. Yep. As well as general improvements in Python, although that's you know a couple of megabytes here and there. But the the Unicode storage improvements really were the sort of the the sort of the thing that's brought a lot of these memory gains because we used Unicode very heavily internally, and this just meant that every place where we were using it was just a little bit more efficient than before. Very nice, so, yeah. This is one of, the, one of the bigger wins. I mean, that, that's um, incredible. That, that, that one's there is almost like a quarter, you know, in, in the best case. Yeah, and I think, I think it eventually sneaks up to about half um, memory usage after like a week or so, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, it's it's just a lot a lot nicer in in sort of the base uh, base configuration. So you you end up with a lot more space for your caches um, than you otherwise would because you can you can store more data per yeah. cache byte. Get a bit right more uh, bang for your buck out of it. So this here is the uh, Synapse Master. Um, so you can see at um, 11.8. I'm not sure why my Grafana is in US states because uh, <laughs> we're, uh, yeah, you guys are British and I'm Australian, so we don't use that for Grafana, you know. Anyway, this this 11 and 8 down here, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse cursor, but uh, yes, the 11 8 oh, cool, is is uh, where we updated it to Python 3. And you can see it's it's not um, as mass massive the gains as the synchrotrons because the synchrotrons most of their memory usage is caches, so basically, yep. um, so they they had a lot of uh, benefit from the uh, Unicode improvements. While the master still gets a lot of those improvements, but because it's not storing as many strings internally, um, it it mostly gets benefits from things like the uh, better dictionary. Uh, storage format in Python 3.6 and just, you know, very small performance improvements here and there um, that have, you know, pulled down the memory usage by about a gig and a half. So, 
still still very uh, very good gains, not as much as a synchrotron, but that's to be expected. And, and right. this is uh, this is worth noting that this is just Synapse directly ported. There's been no real um, Python three specific uh, profiling, or really we haven't had uh, done too much of that anyway. So this is purely just from the port. This isn't any really any performance gains other than than just what Python three brings us. Great. Okay. Um, so CPU is uh, another. So here, here we go. Here's a here's a really good case of um, the CPU benefits that Python three gives us now. I think we can chalk most of it. So you can see this this uh, one here is when we ported the first one to Python 3, yep. and then we ported the other two once we were happy with um, how the first one was going. So you can see the memories drop by roughly about a third, at least. Um, now, what we can chalk that up to is uh, the more efficient iterators, because this code here sort of hits a pathological case of um, iterating through a whole, month, a whole bunch of events uh, where we will quite frequently uh, bail out in the middle of it because you know we found the event we wanted and we don't need to continue processing or just because it really is uh, just on the whole a bit more efficient. So because we were hitting that sort of pathological case so much in the Federation reader, which basically does nothing but hit that code path, you can see some pretty significant uh, CPU gains there. So that basically means that of the three servers there, we could you know, lop off one of them if we wish so, and that would bring us back up to the old uh, CPU utilization. So quite good benefits there. Yeah, really cool, really cool. So you can see, so the Synchrotron also uh, has some CPU benefits. So around here is where we updated it to Python 3. So you can see the green line, which is the updated, uh, yep. which is the Python 3 one is, you know, it's about 10% lower um, while having that massive memory, uh, memory bonus uh, of, you know, cutting it down by about half. So even though this isn't a case where it's like hitting, a, hitting such a terrible case like, like the Federation reader, you can still see some benefits across the board when you're sort of really trying to, to get as much performance out of the system as possible. Right. Um, so this is, this is consistent with what we've seen with a, with a lot of the workers. Um, I think one of them may have slightly higher CPU usage, um, but overall all of them have seen, you know, either slight improvements like this or really good improvements like the Federation reader. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. What what do you um you know, a lot of people maybe listening in are maybe they're running their own Synapse node, um so and they're running it in uh, monolith mode. What 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 can they um expect? So I wouldn't say that the the benefits will be as completely clear as far as CPU and RAM goes for the monolith workers, but. Uh, you will definitely get the effects of just the incremental Python 3 improvements, as well as your caches being far more efficient. Um, on my own home server, I've got roughly about half the memory usage that I did on Python 2, yep. um, just like base memory usage. Um, it, I think it grow, grows up to a couple hundred megs less, but you know every meg counts, and it's basically for for free for upgrading to Python 3. So um, even though the benefits aren't, you know, as, as substantial as the worker mode, there are still uh, quite nice benefits as far as like pulling that memory usage down to more reasonable levels. Even if you know you don't have a have a half or a or a quarter um, reduction in some cases, it's still you know uh, people have reported to me that the the uh, base usage is is much lighter on their hardware and you know, getting some positive feedback from that because it means that people can up their cache level and make their synapses faster while keeping the same uh, footprint as on Python 2. Great, great. And right, and that, that's the thing. This, the reason we're <coughs> talking a lot about our, our port right now is we're right on the cusp of shipping Synapse um, 0 0.34.0, which is the first, the first release where we're just recommending Python 3 for production. So you've yep. been able to do this through a whole bunch of the .33 releases, but this is the first time where we're saying that we, we, we really think this isn't leading edge now, this is, this is something we think you should be doing. Mm -hmm. um, so how can, how can people get this? Once, once .34 is out, which will be in the next, next couple of days, um, how, what, what, what should they do? 
So there's a number of different ways that you can get your hands on this. So one of the more recommended ways, which uh, lets you sort of choose your own Python version, is uh, to install it in a virtual environment. Now, I know a lot of people do this because it gives them sort of a bit more uh, freedom over uh, over installation and what Python packages they want to have. And, you know, it's easier for like Linux users, uh, for a lot of Linux users, but uh, there's also a Docker image that supports, the, uh, there's built on Python 3. So it's like the, the normal tag dash Py3 is the yep. uh, Python 3 version. <coughs> um, we are also looking at releasing uh, Debian packages that sort of wrap up all of the dependencies in a virtual environment so that, um, we get the, the new versions that we need for working on Python 3 because, you know, the Debian ships a couple of year old packages at this point and Python 3 applications kind of need quite, quite recent ones. So that'll allow people that are using our Debian packages to upgrade to Python 3. Um, that'll be a opt-in, uh, sort of opt-in process for the moment where you can optionally upgrade to Python 3. And uh, once we're, you know, a bit more confident in the Debian packaging, then we'll uh, make it a default just because, you know, even if the Python, even if we recommend Python 3, there's still probably some issues that are going to come up from, you know, just packaging, just, that's just how it is. So, um, so we'll be rolling people over to that in, in future while, you know, giving people that, you know, want to try it out right now, a opportunity um, to opt in. Um, there also will be eventually probably <laughs> um, distribution package managers will make the switch, especially those that uh, have sort of gone all in on Python 3, like Arch. Um, I haven't spoken to them yet or so haven't heard anything yet, but um, as we start recommending Python 3, a lot of the distributions that are sort of having Python 3 as their default will hopefully start switching over. So if you, so if you like use Arch you, and you like using Arch repositories for everything, hopefully there'll be a Python 3 version there for you soon. Um, but yeah, currently, if you want to get going right now, the virtual environment or the Docker image is the best way to go. And then it's just uh, to keep everything up to date, it's just a, a pip upgrade or a Docker, Docker pool to keep yourself updated. Um, and then, yeah, if you're a Debian package user, we'll uh, have a bit more information on that once 034 releases. Great. Okay, so look, final, final, final question. Um, someone's just about to start their own uh, Python porting project. What's your advice to them? Well, you should have done a little while ago, <laughs> to be <laughs> honest. It's, uh, we're coming very close to the 2020 release date, but uh, you know, the best time to port to Python 3 was two years ago. The second best time is now. Right. Uh, so, but now that everything's sort of mature, um, there's, you're not going to be running up against as many tooling issues and as many like fundamental uh, tripping, uh, tripping blocks. I think that's a word, probably not a word, but there's a lot of the fundamental issues are sort of gone by now. So it is actually quite a good time to do reporting. So it basically comes down to your code base and the best things you can do there to support a port is to have good test coverage and have good CI and start putting Python 3 in CI as soon as possible. Even if it fails, knowing what fails is uh, is like the, the best thing when someone potentially comes to your project and goes, hey, I want to help you port to Python 3 because I want to use this on Python 3. Having, here's all these tests that fail, um, even if you don't have time to work on them, having that sort of knowledge is very important for other contributors, as right. well as for you if you are, uh, you know, pushing ahead on it. So that's, and then once you have that good test coverage, it also gives you the, uh, you can sort of put it down and go, yes, this will probably work. Um, gives you a bit more <laughs> sort of trust in the process. Um, so because once everything is automated, it makes, uh, makes releasing that less of a stress thing and more of a sort of a, here's this great thing that I've released into the world and you can sort of sleep better at night not knowing that the next day your GitHub issues is going to be filled up with 600 issues like synapses, here's yeah. 800 yeah. issues. But yeah, um, so yeah, it, it just means that you can catch a lot of those problems before users run into them, which is a good thing for everyone. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. All right. Okay. That that's that, that's it from us. Um, the Amber, thank you so much for your time and and, and for your insight. Um, really appreciate that. Uh, anyone watching, if you've got any feedback on, I mean, we're taking a slightly different approach with Matrix Live recently and trying to get a bit more in depth in some of the uh, 
topics that are you know flying around um, uh, Matrix as a project. If you have any feedback on that, let us know uh, in the comments uh, for YouTube or via the Twin Room. Great places. Um, and yeah, that's it until uh, uh, until next week. Yep. Good night and good luck. All right. Bye bye, everybody. See ya.